Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Good whatever time of day it is, wherever you are right now. And thank you for tuning in to the Conversations with Dr. Don show. This show is produced and broadcast in Portland, Oregon. I'm Roger Bates, and I'm hosting the Dr. Don show as he is uh, off for the night. For you first time viewers, Conversation with Dr. Don is an ongoing series of one hour standalone talk shows where we interview interesting people like most of you out there uh, about who they are and you, as unique, uh, one of a kind individuals and about whatever we decided to talk about for the evening. Tonight we're going to be talking about the credit crisis in Greece and some further comments on the European Union. My guest tonight is, Jim, is Jimmy Moglium. Good evening. Good, good evening. Jimmy has been on this show a number of times in the past, so welcome to the show and thank you for, for coming again. Thank you. Hey. Right now, I'm feeling a little nervous. How are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. <laughs> somehow, I hope you're not nervous because of me. <laughs> somehow, no, somehow I thought you would be just fine, but it's in the script, so I needed to ask the question. Each of the conversations with Dr. Don show consists of two major segments. The first segment is, who are you? Uh, segment, and I ask the guests a little bit about who they are personally, so we get a bit to appreciate of why they say or what they say. In the second part, we will move on and talk about Greece and the European Union. So, just start off with a little bit about myself. Again, Roger Bates. I was uh, born in London, England, 1943. I should know that. Um, my parents moved out uh, to the U.S. in 1948. They moved to California, and I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I moved to Portland, Oregon area about 30 years ago. Um, and two years ago or so, I started volunteering for a conversation with Dr. Don, where I work in the, um, in the control room and sometimes between the camera, which is where I feel a lot more comfortable. Anyway, enough about me. Let's uh, talk about uh, Jimmy Moglia. Well, thank you. I think, that, as you mentioned, I've, uh, I've been honored, if you like, to have been on Dr. Don's show <clears throat> a number of times. And uh, I know that Dr. Don's show has a kind of uh, faithful and uh, audience. So I, um, <laughs> I am afraid that everything I say sounds a, a, like a redundant repetition. Okay. However, I'll be as concise as possible. Okay. I am, um, um, I <clears throat> am a British subject, actually. I was born in Italy, and I went to school in Italy. I, by training, education, I'm an engineer, and I worked in, as an engineer from all my professional um, life. In, in what? Electronics, what electronic electronics? engineer. Okay. And then uh, um, I retired a few years ago with the idea of um, writing. So I <clears throat> set myself to write. I've written three, uh, three and a half published books. And my website, which is yourdailyshakespeare.com, mm -hmm. yourdailyshakespeare.com, uh, contains about uh, well, close to 500 articles that I've written in the last three years. It's a pretty extensive one. So much of the information that uh, has to be my, with my biography, so to speak, mm -hmm. can, be, can be found on the site. Okay. And I deal with miscellaneous subjects. The other thing which is pertinent and relevant to, the, um, to this studio here I produce a series I've done it now for over a year, which is called Historical Sketches. And um, uh, this is now on probably the 23rd or 24th episode that we'll, we'll record next week. The episodes are also broadcast, or rather uploaded, on my website, on the same website. There is a link, Historical Sketches, and they are also broadcast much as Dr. Don show across mm -hmm. various station in the, in various stations in the nation <laughs> that picked them up as well as Portland Community College uh, broadcasts them. The idea behind the historical sketches is self-explanatory. I uh, much <clears throat> of what we learn in school in history has to be has to be limited by the nature of education in itself. 
but m many, I have the feel, I believe, I think, that uh, most uh, uh, historical events almost read like a novel. So by uh, d digging a little bit more in, one, in each one of these events, using a variety of sources, original documentation when possible, books by various historians, pro and against, that creates what I think a, um, a subject that can be of interest to some, if in, not necessary to remember it because you cannot remember anything. But <clears throat> that's a, a way to explore the past, to use, yeah. okay. to use, to use a big, word, big phrase. Re repeat just again, uh, uh, again, uh, where somebody goes to find out about this? Your Daily or YourDailyShakespeare.com. Dot com, okay. And then there are various links. There is much there to read, much more than anyone <laughs> can be interested. However, I must say, not for, not for bragging, it is, um, I'm surprised because it started, when I started, uh, I had no, I had no audience like anyone else. And now I get about between, between three and 7,000 viewers per month, which is not too bad for people who don't, mm -hmm. so, okay. so, like anyone else, actually. If you, if you, uh, content, as they say, is the key. So, I've not, I've not the time nor the inclination to find out what, how do I compare with, uh, with uh, websites of the similar ilk. But um, there are not too many, so maybe that's one of the reasons why I get some. So. Plus, people also get my book through that. So. Okay, very good. And okay. I get some kind of get inquiries from. The most extra, the most at least today, the world is very small. But I get inquiries or comments from people who are absolutely the proverbial other side of the world. So I have some um, faithful uh, subscribers from, for example, from the from the Seychelles Islands. <laughs> so mm -hmm. which is which is uh, proverbially uh, physically on the other side <laughs> of the world, and uh, as well as other places that I just come to know of their existence through the visitors. Okay. All right. Very good. Um, let me get back just, just a little bit. Um, your education, which, which country, where did you I go? I studied in Italy. All my education is Italian. Is Italian. And, um, and my postgraduate education, there have been various places, but my, my formal education is Italian. Okay. Yes. And when did you move to the United States? It's a long story because I, I moved here for a very short while, and then my um, uh, my employer resent me back to Europe. So I lived in in the island of Guernsey for uh, five years uh, in the Channel Islands, which was the, the base of operation of my employer in Europe, and um, and also in London, in uh, excuse me, near London and um, Hertfordshire, and then um, I came back here, which is. In, early 80s, so I've been here for a while. Hmm. Okay. Um, since we are going to be talking about politics quite a bit, let me just ask, ask you where you put yourself in, in, the, um, in the political arena, left, right, center? I think it's fair to say that the left does not exist anymore. <laughs> no, it, there is no longer. It's, I think it's fairly to say. So it, 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 is, it is proven by the fact that um, uh, for several, it's, it's, it's a um, worldwide phenomenon. In many, in more than one countries, there are efforts at calling a party of the left, which actually is not a left at all. So from that point of view, I don't stand anywhere. And I, I never belonged to a party except for a very short time but it was a party that had to do with, with, uh, believe it or not, with the, um, with the um, reevaluation, the rekindling, and the resurgence of local languages. But that was a very temporary stuff. So I never belonged to any party. Yeah. And um, some of the, I, I don't think I'd classify myself. Probably a radical, maybe, but uh, at least in my ideas, okay. not in my actions. All right, all right. Um, I was I was hoping to to kind of ask it relative to U.S. politics, or and then say and how does and how does how does you that compare to European? Um, because um, I, I feel like left, right, and center are distinctly course, different. Course. Yes, um, 
Well, in the United States, there is no left. You know, well, you can, <laughs> uh, to 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 repeat somebody mm -hmm. that has something that has been has been memorized by most. Um, the Republicans and 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 Democrats are two wings of the same bird of prey, which was by Buchanan. So, uh, can, we, can, can we say that there is the Democratic wing and the Republican wing, wing of the uh, corporatist uh, party? Whatever. Yes, it's a it's a more articulate way of expressing it. Uh, the um, so on that so from that point of view, uh, the, the United States politics, quote unquote, is cannot really be compared with, uh, okay. with, yeah. the Europea with the European or with the European scene, except that given that given the predominance or the exceptionalism, depending on how you want to see it, given the predominance of the United States um, hegemonic stance on the world, it almost follows that all the so-called European countries and even some that are not uh, not uh, part of the European Union, they all both follow the lead. They all follow the lead of the hegemon. So there may be parties which call somewhat left in their title, but they're not left at all, in my view. Anyway, that was mm, yeah. an answer. Okay. Um, I think maybe we have uh, gone far enough in, in, in this area, and it's a little early, but I think maybe what we should uh, just go ahead and um, take a break now if, if people are ready, and then we can get back and start talking about uh, Greece and the European Union. Okay, we're back. Oh no, that was not good. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Thanks for staying tuned. Uh, for you viewers who missed the opening of the show, Conversations of Dr. Don is an ongoing series, one hour talk show programs, where we interview interesting people, um, like most of you out there, about uh, who they are and what uh, unique, uh, one-of-a-kind individuals and about whatever we decided to talk about. Tonight we're going to be talking about the uh, credit crisis in Greece and some additional comments on the European Union and my guest here is Jimmy Moglia. So if we can start, let's get back, let's get uh, some background on what's going on in Greece because I think there are probably a lot of viewers who don't even follow it. Well, I'm pretty sure that viewers will have heard about it <clears throat> and I, I yeah. don't do it. <laughs> you don't know American viewers. I, I do not even <laughs> pretend that my opinion has any weight. I can only re perhaps relay the little that I was able to research sure. but from <laughs> only from the anecdotal point of view so how can you become how can you become interested in Greece and there is a story so I'll tell you the story which has nothing to do with the as little or nothing to do with the actual um, political current or events okay. in Greece. Okay. But I spent five years of my misspent youth in uh, toiling with uh, the ancient Greek, yeah, the ancient Greek language, which was uh, absolutely useless. So, but, but, um, so in these days here, following the, uh, the referendum, as most people have heard about, the referendum in Greece, there has been there has been a resurgence of interest in historical characters uh, of ancient Greece. 
Uh, there have been Socrates, Plato, uh, Aristotle, Euripides, Sophocles, uh, even, um, even the guy whom I remember by the name of Philippides. Philippides was he who was he who um, ran all the way from the field of battle to Athens to tell the to tell the um, council of Athens that something has happened here <laughs> the, the council of Athens, that they had won the battle of Marathon, and so he had enough strength to get to the Senate, say, we won in Greek, mm -hmm. and uh, drop dead on the floor. But anyway, so even these names have come out. And that, uh, that has brought me back, and um, this has nothing to do with Greece, but we are here in an, in an, in an anecdotal mm -hmm. mood. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, I'll tell you something about um, what something to do with my so-called education. See, when I grew up, the high school, where I, the type of high school I went to was called the Lyceum, which is a Latin rendition, rendering of a Greek word that was a, referred to a mental gymnasium dedicated to the Apollo Lyceum. Apollo Lyceum. Anyway, anyway, and in this, in this Lyceum, at the end of, you had to st you study Greek, and at the end of the five years, uh, five years uh, study, you had to pass an examination. It was called the classic maturity. That's the big name. <laughs> and uh, this was a, the, 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 the strongest form of cruel and unusual uh, punishment Punish. that could be inflicted on the mind of a 17-year-old. Certainly sounds intimidating. Because, they, you, <laughs> because you had to remember or to be, you, you, can ex, you could be expected to be interrogated on all the subjects you studied during the last three years. See? So, however, since yeah. this was the toil of everyone, you know, the destiny of everyone, uh, you know, I just uh, looked at it recently. In 1931, just uh, smack in the Mussolini's years in Italy, there was a professor by the name of Bignami. And this professor came up with the idea of printing summaries of the various subjects. He was, he was a professor of literature, but uh, he started the idea of printing these summaries. Whereupon, even today, almost a hundred years later, uh, a summary is called um, Binyami. It's, it's name, his name has become synonym with the summary. It's almost what we have now, the notes. Well, well there's, a, there's a, an equivalent here in, in, for the students. And, um, but even the summaries, which were booklet, gray booklet, very nice, uh, even the summaries were way too much to remember. <laughs> you know, for the, so it was left to the, to the individual, to the individual student to come up with whatever system he may find to remember as much as he could, because it possibly couldn't possibly remember everything. Mm -hmm. And I had developed, all oh, this is it's, it's tied up with Greece here. I had <laughs> yeah. I'm getting away, but it's yes, just, just to remind it, <laughs> to remind the possible viewer that I'm not that I have not have not been drinking. But anyway, <laughs> the the, um, the, I, the technique I developed, and there's a reason why I'm telling you this later, was to <clears throat> um, use uh, early uh, friendly ear ear friendly musical tunes, and to adapt lyrics in a rhythmical mm -hmm. way. So that I could remember the tune, the lyrics that had to that had to do with what to remember, yeah. and just as I was um, following the, in the Greek, when I heard some politician spewing out some of these names that I mentioned before, there were others. I remember that it come to mind one one jingle that I um, that I still remember, and it has to do with the a well, philosopher or astronomer. Uh, the, a Greek astronomer. Not many people, I assume, I assume, maybe I'm wrong, but not many people know that the, the man who discovered that the Earth turns or spins around the Sun as opposed to vice versa, it was, the, it was called the heliocentric theory, was not Copernicus, um, there was a friend of God just around Galileo's time, 1600, but was actually a Greek. And the name of the yes. Greek astronomer was Aristarchus of Samos. Aristarchus of Samos, which I couldn't possibly remember, except that I had met the jingle. 
And I can, the jingle had the rhyme, okay. so we'll translate it. And it, the, the jingle went, Aristarchus of Samos, the earth spins around the sun, come on, let's go. And that made me the jingle. So <laughs> anyway. Whatever works. Whatever, whatever works. The only, um, the situation as we've seen, as we described by so many sources, is what we see on the surface what is behind the surface, mm -hmm. what we can think may happen behind the surface, and what we think we know. So the only thing I can say, because it's an interesting, it's an interesting chapter in European history, insofar as maybe, perhaps, I don't think so, but they will find a way of, um, of um, um, getting out of this uh, currency, or the euro currency, who knows, probably. I think they won't, but anyway, we'll see. So okay. the only the thing that I that I immediately <coughs> comes to the eye in, in the context of this referendum are two things which I think are important ones. Mm -hmm. Everybody says interrupt. Do you have a question? Yeah. Well, I, um, I just want to kind of get clarified on the, on this. Greece is part of the European Union, mm -hmm. okay? um, and and also the eurozone. Yes. Yes. And those two terms I have seen used interchangeably, and they are distinctly different. Um, um, I am not, I'm not terribly familiar with everything, but the Eurozone means somebody like, uh, places like, um, I guess, this is the old um, East, East European countries like um, Poland, Romania, um, and places like that, that um, may use the euro, but they are not formally part of the union, or may use their currency as well as the euro. Yes. I'm not part of the union. So Greek right now is part of the European Union, and it does use the euro as its currency. Yes. Being part of the European, or European Union implies belonging to the European zone, whereas being in the euro, European zone does not necessarily mean that you're part of the European Union. So it's a bit complicated. Okay. It's a mouthful, yeah. but that's, 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 that's where it's, yeah. it starts getting a little complicated for yeah. me. Yes. It's a mouthful. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, yeah. so, on the, so on, the, on the business of the referendum, it is said that the majority voted no, and, uh, but it, what is not said is the majority of the people actually did not vote. <laughs> so, so which gives another, uh, another flavor to the situation, number one. And number two, is that although everybody says they voted no to austerity, I attempted to, to, to investigate or to find out mm -hmm. what they were actually voting for, which was written in Greek, or New Greek, which I don't know, but it was translated. So the, the, the voting yes was voting in a proposal that the current, current government had made back Last, on, last year, last year, when order, already be, the previous oh, government had made okay. it, because this is a long, it's a long story. So there was nothing new. And the second, and the second one was a proposal that the government had already made to the, so -called, they called it the Troika, although Orwellianly they've changed the name to the institutions, but there's three banks which act like some kind of monsters. <laughs> um, controlling the, the economies of each individual state. But anyway, so the second, the second proposal had to do with a repeat, was a repeat of a proposal that the government had made to the Central Union and had already been rejected. So they were, they were saying no to somebody that had already been said no. So that is okay. somewhat, somewhat, somewhat in itself. So the referendum was what 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 was vote, voted on was technically meaningless. However, it has been it has been um, used from what we can gather. Because I say from what we can gather because often what it seems, as we know, is not what it is. But um, has been used a referendum against austerity, as they say. Although I am I'm hard time to think who is for austerity. I mean, who is for for, 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 um, for living well, a lesser life. Well, is, isn't it the, uh, the banks, the uh, Eurocentric, um, 
euro central central bank. Yeah, that's right. Um, yes, but I'm saying if I if I would imagine even if United States, if there were a referendum saying, would you like to leave in poorer condition or in better conditions, very few would act. Yes, we would like to have austerity. Right, but I, I felt like that the government was was looking for um, um, backing from the people that they should. Yes. Uh, continue the, continue their struggle against uh, austerity with with yes and, with and, with and, some and reservation that are not said to well, begin with Syriza means or well it's, it defines itself as a as a party of the radical left which is nothing but right is nothing but the left as I said before anyway. um, the second point I think to consider is that as you, some people may have followed it. Uh, just prior to these, uh, to the referendum, they both shut down the bank and they put a limit to the amount of uh, of money that people withdraw could uh, withdraw, day. but also put a limit on what they put, would send overseas. Which, if that being the case, one would say, why not imposing a limit on the transfers of funds abroad at the beginning of the government? Because this was put in place because they were coming. So they already. That already leaves a question. Um, secondly, um, why? How? Although there was a 60, if I remember correctly, 61 percent said uh, no. Or mm -hmm. We don't want to say, it, and the other one said yes. And who in heaven would say I'm going to say yes? Particularly when um, there are various extant cases now when um, people, um, there are people actually commit suicide because they cannot. By the pension is not enough. Then there was a, a very touching letter um, written by a pensioner who committed suicide in the main square, the Syntagma Square in Athens, where he says, uh, "I am too old to fight, and I do not want to be reduced to look through the garbage mm -hmm. cans to make a living." Yeah. So, but then my life. Now, so, when when you say um, pensions in in, in Greece, is that f uh, kind of equivalent to uh, like social security payments that, that we have? I am in the not US? sure. There, I am not sure. There, are the in the particular instance of the guy said I I paid for my pensions for mm -hmm. thirty six years, whatever he said, mm -hmm. if I remember. Um, there, there is, there was, or there is some kind of social security of sorts, which, however, now is almost, from what I understand, is almost collapsed. So. <clears throat> I am. I cannot answer the question. Okay. So, so when you talk about but when you talk about pensions, is is that to uh, retired government workers, or <coughs> to oh, people the, as a, the, or everyone, or every, every, everyone. everyone, because uh, that's not the, uh, from what I understand. Okay. So mm -hmm. this, when you say talk about Greece, I cannot make statement about what I don't know. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I was able to find out are one that it is very curious that they establish a limit of transferring funds abroad and not at the beginning because the, uh, ever since this so-called crisis was triggered uh, there been a flow out of, of, of billions of trillion whatever billions uh, from, um, from 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 the Greek from the Greek um, from Greece mm -hmm. to abroad and there are two points uh, there are three, actually four points that I think ought to be considered. One is that one of the things that, uh, one of the tales of legends which have been spread by the European mainstream media, now I don't know what happened here because I really cannot take any longer the media that I see, Fox News anyway. But anyway, um, is that the, uh, the Greeks had, uh, were lazy or have been squandered funds, which is absolutely untrue. And if one looks at the actually the, the number of hours that the Greeks as a whole, statistically, if the, if the statistics are right, <laughs> is ex, it's a, a number one in Europe. They work the longest hours of all. So from that point of view, that is that is a legend. And the other thing that <clears throat> is not said, uh, unsaid, is that. But people, when you mention it, people certainly recognize it. Uh, Greek. Greece has one of the wealthiest clans of people, namely those people who, who um, 
on the fleets, fleets of, of ships. You know, if people may still have remember Onassis, who was mm -hmm. the husband of Jacqueline Kennedy, but the, his, this, his fleet is still Greece. They, they use other, other, other flags, mm -hmm. but um, there are several, uh, quite a few dozens of people who have actually owned, owned fleets, uh, merchant fleets. And all these people are tax-free because they're all the earnings that they make on these uh, uh, flag carriers are not are not taxable in Greece. So by looking at just at the volume of, um, of business of profits that these uh, fleets make, just half of the tax on that would cover any debit, <laughs> any any uh, possible okay. large debit on it. And nobody's uh, then talking about. No, nobody's possibly. talking about. You see, this is this is part of the. <laughs> this is part of what is called the collective, um, collective. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not even amnesia, collective disinterest, mm -hmm. because there is <laughs> there is a tendency not only not only among the so-called people of which you are all part of the people, but, uh, but among a section of the people who like to call themselves cultured or intelligentsia. Yeah? There is a there is a certain ease in becoming very enthusiastic about about um, inspiring ideas, as I mentioned before, about all these Greeks and and the uh, legends and, and 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 the marathon and the battles and the astronomers and the philosophers and the dignity and the uh, history and the civilization of it. But uh, yeah, it's all very good, but um, without it's not, it's not enough to. Uh, to um, even thinking of what could be a solution or to something like this. Well, plus the, the other point is that, which is again not ever spoken about, one of the uh, one of the largest holdings of property and assets in Greece is the church, and the church is not taxed. So, by definition, there as well. So, so you here you have. Two major sources of um, of revenue, uh, of, revenue. of untaxed revenue, mm -hmm. which by themselves, the only lightly touched, will probably, I, I can not be sure, but based on what we read any all the time, will probably compensate for anything which is due. And the third, for the final, the fourth point is that the main, I will call them the mainstream media because that's not, they have circulated the voice that unless. Um, Greece subjects herself to this violent regime of austerity. All the other uh, European countries and their people will have to individually suffer their pensions in order to pay for the debt, which seems a very strange thing to say yeah. because it doesn't make it may, this make little sense. So, all in all, to conclude this long monologue, mm -hmm. <laughs> from what? From what, 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 from what one could gather, one, all that is said is only a little part of what we see. Two, we don't know what actually games go behind it. Mm -hmm. Three, there are resources there apparently that would make easily get out of the, get out of this dilemma. Four, the very people who are now hailed as heroes for in this saga, are actually very rich people, including Tsipras. And the other one, whoever his name on, so it looks like um, very, so they individually they they have very little to, to lose. They all come from very wealthy families, so uh, it has all the characteristics of a very well staged, amusing, as I said, even maybe remember things that I didn't before c come to mind. It has all the hallmarks of a large, well staged, well orchestrated, interesting, sometimes amusing pantomime. Hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, so where where do they go from here? I have no uh, idea. Have, you Nobody have no knows. idea. Um, um, what think? What I think will not happen is that. <laughs> I mean, the, the European Central Bank seems to be saying, if you want any money at all, you have to accept our our rules of austerity. Um, and, yes, except that we could repeat. There are words that they float in the air without knowing exactly what it means. Except the, 
Uh, one of the things that they want to, of course, privatize more, there has been privatized and things like this. So there have been rumors, and maybe there are all these also staged there, um, uh, that uh, Greece may get a little bit closer to the to Russia the or to Eurasia. Yeah. But I don't think that will happen. And an interesting thing is if we look at the, actually, the numbers, I don't think that those numbers are, can be falsified. Uh, Greece is actually the country who's percentually, there are small percentages, but spends more on the military than all the other ones, even more than percentage than France. I had heard, I had heard that it was second, uh, third, sorry, third, U.S. No, no, in terms of in Europe, it, in Europe. Okay. In Europe um, is, but in Greece um, is, is, is the number one. Number one in terms in, of in percentage Europe. of funds spent yes. on the military. Yes, and so, I, don't, I don't think of Greece as, as no, having a military but, presence. No, but the well, they have, it has a, everybody has a military. <laughs> but all this, really, the military, as everybody knows now, is a well concocted means in order to uh, distribute funds. <laughs> so distribute funds to, to the people who sell the arms. So that's why you, that's why you have all these military bases and exercises, and new atom bombs. For sure, for sure. And so uh, it's, a, it's a good source of business. So. Right, OK. Um, well, I'm not, not sure where to, you're not pre presenting um, uh, much in, in terms of, of options here. Uh, first of uh, all, I, I'm just a citizen. Citizen uh -huh. X Y Z, so I have no okay, idea okay. what I'm saying. As far as I'm concerned, um, I think that the whole thing is a pantomime, mm -hmm. uh, as many things that are pantomime. Or you can even even use worse language, but uh, okay. uh, it has. Uh, no, it, it's it's all over the place. This particular game that is being played mm -hmm. for the benefit of the people who yeah. want to believe it. So uh, the the items that I just mentioned. Is not to say, hey, look what I found out. It's just to, it's information available to anyone who wishes who wishes to search. Okay. For example, even those documents on the referendum, I didn't invent them. You can look at them through on the internet. Fortunately, these days that referendum came up very quickly. In fact, if they really, if um, if they wanted, uh, this is one reason why I think it's a pantomime because the referendum in itself is not a bad idea, but they could have done it at the beginning before <clears throat> all the funds went out of the country. Before all the, all the, because there is a, the, all the people who voted yes, and there are not, mm -hmm. uh, there are not a small percentage, are people who have been, at least this I read from a Greek, from some of, who wrote it from Greece, are one, people who have been strongly influenced by the local mainstream Greek media who said, vote yes, otherwise you will lose your pension, you will lose whatever mm -hmm. you have. There will be no medicine left. Uh, uh, the yeah. hospitals have to shut down. So there was a fear mongering, mm -hmm. and also, <clears throat> but that didn't work. It, it did not work. But it, even if it did not work, it may still may end up being the same thing. So it's not the, it's not that voting no means that the dangers, technically the dangers that they were sure. profiled, yeah. go away. Yeah. It just as a, as you mentioned right. yourself, it was a way of. Uh, uh, convincing the world, uh, the world audience, mm -hmm. if you like, yeah. that that was a means of convincing whoever d makes these strange decisions about maxi f debts and maxi funds and maxi relief yeah. to take a, a better view, or rather a more lenient view, whatever it applies yeah. to the situation. Okay. Should we we talk a little bit about just the um, European Union Union? Just as an entity itself, when it was formed and what it was originally formed for. Yes, um, as usual, uh, it was formed with an intent, and it's morphed completely into different things than it mm -hmm. was at the beginning. It happens. Well, as everybody know, I think that that class is on the way out. <laughs> yeah. Um, after World War II, um, there was still the belief, or rather, the expect lingering, lingering um, hypothesis that since there had been two civil wars in Europe, I called them First World War and Second World War to mm -hmm. me, were civil wars. Uh, there were two civil wars in Europe already, and so to avoid 
mathematically the need, the possibility of a third world a civil war. Um, the, it was the European in Union came about. It came about in stages, and the first implementation of the European Union was the, the central had a name in French, but the central uh, the, the committee for the European of coal and iron. It was a way of pooling in ways that I do not I do not know or even studied how it was done. But anyway, forming this association for coal and iron was a way of avoiding the monopolization of these clearly important war commodities mm -hmm. because you need iron in order to make arms. And so that was established very early, I believe in the 50s or something like this. Then that it enlarged gradually to encompass other goods, and then it came about that, then it, it evolved further to um, have a free trade zone, essentially, there were no longer custom ex there were no custom duties between countries. Okay, so, uh, the so only thing left was that each country had a currency and, and each country had a nationality, so that you to go from one country to the next, you had to show your passport. And um, so then uh, things uh, changed dramatically. It changed on the, on the world stage, so to speak, as you probably know, when, when there was the first, maybe the second, the first Orange Revolution was in China. But the second Orange Revolution was in Russia, when they when they they finished the Soviet Union, and that put a different spin to to the whole aspect of the European Union, because it became it became associated even more so with NATO, as you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so the. Then, of course, in 1997, they decided to another thing, which was crucial, to have a, 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 a uh, unified currency, which on the on the on first appearance it would seem it's a good idea, but in fact, by doing that, all countries all countries uh, essentially renounced their own uh, a very strong piece of their own nationality. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a currency, you can print, you can print as much as you like, and the current the value of the currency goes down. But you can adjust it back you and forth. Write. So that if you, your goods from abroad will cost more, but your goods abroad will cost less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and that's a very has always been an important means of, of, of uh, equilibrium, not no longer existing. Right. So, count. so individual cur countries having their own uh, currency gives. The government more control over the economy. It's, a, it's called the national part of the national state um, is yeah. to have currency, the bank, uh, the control over money as well as control of its own laws. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the control of the money is gone. Mm -hmm. The laws are a quagmire at the moment, but some of the laws that come from um, from this so-called central huge bureaucratic. Uh, uh, monster in Brussels and Strasbourg. So, so that that's an advantage of having uh, the euro uh, as a common currency. What it, what's the uh, what's the advantage? The advantage? None. Mm. The advantage? Then why well, did, the, then what did the countries do? <clears throat> well, there is the minor advantage that you can spend euros in Portugal as well, as you don't have to go to the to the change office. Usually. But in, again, that's. Minor because now most of these transactions are go with the credit card, so <laughs> you can you can charge your credit card in any country. Uh, th so there are really no significant advantages, but it's a trend. It is a uh, a means towards the eventual goal, which is to have a supranational set up, where the nations are of formally maybe the language will remain, mm. but remain formally a nation. But in effect, the the nations uh, lose their what is called what is normally associated with nationality. This is not new in history, by the way, but because at, the, at one point there was uh, there were the we were talking about the Magna Carta. At one point there was a feudal system, and the feudal system gradually morphed into the national states with the great monarchies. So that was 
there was a, a flow that take, took a few hundred years. Mm -hmm. I don't know how long it will take before all the world we will be um, under the under the heel of large corporations that it's will dictate that will dictate what happens here and there, including Greece. It certainly seems to be coming. Yes, but and but unfortunately, some of these people. I think it's already here. Yeah, but it's not just. Yeah, still you still have a, a different flags and things. Like that. Mm -hmm. Maybe the flag will remain right. like a yeah. Confederate flag, but just as a as a symbol. Okay, so back to Greece. Um, if do they have the option of getting out of the euro? I have no idea. I think this. If everybody talks about it. My impression. My my guess is it's worth less than the air used to express it but my guess is that they will do something if they cannot get out of this immediate conundrum mm -hmm. will do something which was done before in other countries too which is to have to print their own in interim money whether they call it drachma they will call it something else the mm. pieces of paper this is this you can use in order to to buy your groceries or whatever else. Okay. And um, how long will that go for? I do not know. But um, that would be a solution to, the, it's possibly the intermediate solution rather than leaving immediately the euro is to have this dual currency going, one which is listed okay. and the other one which is an official, which is, happens in, in many All countries. Right. All right. I had not heard about that, that as an option. Um, but I, I had wondered about if they weren't in the euro, whether whether Greece would have more options and to. Oh, I think to they deal should. My opinion, if I, 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 it sounds they like they will probably they will probably, um, as per usual, the, the the people who suffer now will suffer a little bit more, but not indefinitely. I mean, I'm I'm thinking about Iceland, that I think they what they did. Um, it's a smaller country. There are less people. I don't I don't know enough to make an op even to have. An opinion that's based on an opinion. <laughs> yeah, um, what I was reading was that they basically declared bankruptcy. I think it was in 2008, and everybody was saying, "Ooh, this this is going to be really terrible. This is going to going to ruin the country." And um, they, in fact, recovered in within two or three years and back to doing much better than they than they were before they were yes I'm, I'm so the, you know it, it, it wasn't <laughs> the catastrophe that that of course the bankers wanted to well, say I, I don't think they will let it come to the catastrophe of having okay of having um, a revolution partly because the military is very strong and it's under the under control of Uncle Sam so what does the military do in Greece what does the military do here <laughs> Or we, we we go and invade other countries, and you know, we, we we try and um, uh, with he, 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 hegemony, we we try and rule other countries without invading them. Well, that, yes, well, with a threat of military intimidate other countries. Yeah. Um, but the, well, that that question should be asked of all the question of the countries of Europe. Yeah. But there are expect. It's a source of business. It's a it's a source mm -hmm. of business. So if you say to a country you have to spend so much time on military, they have to oh, to buy okay. from Would, whatever. So. Oh, that that is one one of the other requ requirements of the Euro um, European Union is that the the member countries do have to spend a certain so amount. Of, uh, this is what we read. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, so. Uh, so that the, I don't have an answer. In, f f frankly, the m military in uh, in Europe um, is a compl complete waste of time because uh, Russia, I don't think, will ever invade. And if they weren't very determined to invade, I think it would be pretty bad for everyone. Um, even if, as I read today, uh, I heard about them, that the uh, United States said that they have experimented successfully the first nuclear gravity uh, gravity nuclear bomb I don't know what it means what but on it, earth yeah I heard it yeah do you probably what is that I have no idea but okay, just me I neither. Heard it. they have uh, they, the Pentagon you make them up and they, they well, it was a dummy nuclear gravity bomb I don't know what it means <laughs> but um, at least it was a dummy this is what they said so they 
is the whole structure, the, the whole structure of, uh, British, of politics, society, um, rules, European Union, European currency, they're all intertwined in, in a tangle which, unle which is very difficult to know about it in, in a rational way. So everything which we discussed even tonight has to be taken with a, with a large and a huge pinch of salt, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we, what's really going behind the scenes? <clears throat> but certain things like, for example, the, we, we, talking about the poverty of Greece, you, as I mentioned before, it's, nobody thinks about, well, what about the, the people, the magnates and the, the fleets, you know, there are people, there are billionaires, multi-billionaires, uh, tax exempt. So <clears throat> this, this cycle of the of perennial augmenting greed, which is characterizes the one percent, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, has no stop, cannot be stopped. So it is very natural that it is in the flow of things that um, always they always want more. No, oh, well, um, it is kind of uh, equivalent. To, it's just like gravity, where the more money you have. Wherever money gets centralized, it just pulls more into it. And where power is centralized, it pulls more power into it. And there are many people who draw, who feed at the trough, so. And, I, right. A, um, and every once in a while, somehow, you have to flip it over and start again. And it's, that's that a role be in, really not in my lifetime. <laughs> yeah, yes. But uh, that's the situation. So. Um, well, I'm not sure. We're uh, running down a little, little uh, on the time. But um, if you have any other oh, oh, comments subjects. that that you would yeah. like to make to uh, fill out well, about another yeah. about four, as I was about saying, four minutes. Yes, four minutes. Uh, yeah, it's four minutes. As I said before, as I, I, I make, um, I produce a program here called Historical Sketches, and the next one will have to do with the Magna Carta, which has only a, a certain reference certain historical par parallel or a parallelism with, uh, with Greece because yeah. this year is the anniversary. It was a, the um, anniversary, 800 anniversary of the Magna Carta, which is hailed as the prototype, or rather, the, uh, the first document which is, is the embodiment of democracy, which may be true because one statement it was made on, but it is, again, like in Greece, it is usually overlooked that that document lasted less than two months because the, uh, the, the very king who signed it uh, dis um, dissociated with it, with, with the document. He was helped by the Pope who said the document is invalid. And, um, and there were reasons for it. And by the way, all this was also made, Shakespeare made part of it in, the, in the, his play called King John. The reason for this, why it became useless immediately, had to do with the fact that uh, those who, who uh, promoted or signed this document or created this document were the famous barons, uh, who indeed were becoming more and more powerless towards the central, towards the most important of the barons, who was the king. Mm -hmm. So they decided that they had enough, and not only they made the Magna Carta, but sooner, uh, soon later, shortly later, there was a civil war, and uh, the barons lost. So that was one of the funding, one of the important elements that contributed to the towards the established establishment of a very powerful monarchy. Because through the Middle Ages, the monarch was one, was the the Did strongest yes. the strongest man or the strongest among the feudal yes. guys. But they were not exa exactly they were not they had allegiances of sorts. They were vassals, but they had a significant degree of independence. Not now. So, so that was the parallel with Greece is that not everything <laughs> what we hear as identifying elements of a phenomenon is not actually what happens. So in the same way that um, in the case of the Magna Carta, following it, there were, uh, there were battles. And the, with, the king was able to 
defeat the um, the rebelling uh, vassals, took all their lands, took all their castles. So it was it was pretty successful operation. So, so on his side. it really didn't work as. as it didn't it as, didn't work as a, as it's a, okay, but it, uh, but it does uh, list some. Uh, some goals or some lofty ideas that we still there was one because it's a very complicated document I haven't read it all but uh, there were many many issues uh, which we can't even we cannot even uh, unscramble what they were because they had to do with things that happened in 1215 but uh, the main one was uh, was the article the article 39 that uh, had this lofty statement that you cannot impose taxes without without their approval yeah which was which was, sounds very good and accepted and again it was gone so, to almost immediately so <laughs> <laughs> and it, instead of taxing they took all the land so which it was a raw oh, deal well, okay. <laughs> okay they may have been better off paying the taxes all right all right i think there uh, is about time to, good. Uh, good. to uh, start to bring things down so if we have some um, uh, public service announcements ah there we go uh, to learn more about the ACLU, go to uh, www.aclu.org. Uh, that's uh, an organization that uh, we certainly need to uh, help protect the individuals against the, uh, um, the power of, of uh, government and big business. Um, to learn um, how to end, end, ending corporate personhood, we definitely need to do that. So go to um, www.movetoamend.org, and if you haven't signed their, their petition, uh, be sure and sign it now, and uh, let your um, representatives uh, know that uh, you support uh, um, overturning uh, the, that amendment. Okay, so, oh, thanks for watching, and remember KFC. No, not that KFC, Dr. Don's KFC. Be kind, oh, kind, friendly, and charitable. Be kind, be friendly, and be charitable to you too. And you, Jimmy, and you out there, and you in the uh, control room, and thank you very much. Okay.